Today I would like to focus on increasing incidence of pulmonary embolism and our experience and problems and roadblocks that we faced in trying to start a PERT program. And we will talk a little bit about um, why cardiology needs to be a part of that program. And second, I'll briefly touch upon the devices and the newer aspects of pulmonary embolism that we are dealing with in the last couple of years. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if somebody is going to talk about the devices. Uh, I, was, I believe there was somebody else who was going to touch on them, but if not, we can talk about it a little bit later. Okay. I don't have any financial relationships to disclose. I'll begin with a case report, which kind of highlights some of the issues that we face with pulmonary embolism. You know, we had a 67-year-old male who came to an outside hospital for a shortness of breath that was gradually worsening. And he came to the hospital after about four days. Usual routine risk factors, he had a leg injury uh, the week before, a minor one, which kind of uh, immobilized him for a little bit. He came to the hospital, he was diagnosed with uh, pulmonary embolism, and he was started on heparin. He appeared to be hemodynamically stable, but he had increasing oxygen requirements. And so next day they sent him to our hospital, and when he showed up, he had a respiratory rate of about 20, and uh, oxygen requirement of about eight liters. And we did a stat echo bedside, and that showed RV dilation and um, CT angiogram, when it reviewed it, he had a very large central thrombus extending into both the pulmonary arteries. So we had him go to the cath lab. Uh, on call was radiology at that time. And uh, while they were getting ready, patient went into pulmonary, you know, pulseless electrical activity. So they, we did a code blue, et cetera, and while they were doing the CPR, we got access, and, uh, you know, we got uh, arterial venous access, we used a flow retriever to take out the clot, and then he became, you know, somewhat stable, but still a little bit hypotensive and requiring even more oxygen. So we put it in a right heart cath, and then uh, we did an ECMO to bail him out. And uh, he struggled for about like three, four weeks before he started to get better. And uh, this was the clot that we actually took out, you know, the huge clot all the way from both the left and right pulmonary arteries. So this case kind of highlights a couple of things for me. One is the importance of early case detection and recognition of the requirement for further treatment and risk stratification of this patient. You know, does he need to go to the cath lab sooner than later? And the role of pulmonary embolism team in managing these patients and what are the new options in terms of catheter-based thrombectomies and uh, you know, clot extraction devices that we have? If you really look at it, uh, pulmonary embolism is kind of under-recognized as a you know, leading cause of death. It is the third most preventable leading cause of death in, in, in US at least. And uh, at least 15%, 30-day all-cause mortality is seen in high-risk pulmonary embolism patients. And nearly 50% have long-term issues after pulmonary embolism. This is especially worse if you have an underlying DVT that's also recognized. Post-phlebitic syndromes are much higher, at least 50%. And what is really important also in the long term is nearly 10% of the people have a quality of life that is comparable to CHF, CHF or cancer. So the other thing that we need to look at is over a period of years, the mortality morbidity have been improving for STEMIs and, you know, other structured programs where there is a team that takes care of these uh, you know, uh, patients when they're present to the hospital. You can see that the STEMI uh, mortality rate has significantly improved over a period of 15, 20 years. If you look at pulmonary embolism over the last 20 years, they have been still hanging around 25% for high risk mortality and uh, at least 6% for intermediate risk submassive patients with a significant uh, bleeding risk still persistent. And uh, you, you see in the last two, three years, four years, the bleeding risk has come down more because we have been using other modalities and we have changed the thrombolytic therapy requirements. Okay. So, if, you know, uh, the next speaker is probably going to speak about uh, the 
uh, the classification and things like that. I'm going to briefly go over that. But if you look at the number of patients, nearly 65% are high-risk PEs. And uh, the 30% are about intermediate risk pulmonary embolism cases. In other words, just about 5% of patients are suitable for IV heparin and oral anticoagulation going at home. Okay. And uh, when you don't have a PERT team or a standardized approach to pulmonary embolism, what really happens? Well, if you look at the literature, nearly 75% do not receive any interventional consult in general. And about 90% of these thromboembolic patients receive conservative medical management. And nearly 40% are lost to follow up. They don't even come back and you don't know how they are doing. Okay. And uh, one of the biggest challenges is unlike a STEMI program or a stroke program that we have, there is no team for a pulmonary embolism. We didn't have one for a, almost like last four years is when we really started to put it together. You need a lot of, you know, effort to go in. There's no defined protocol. There is no awareness of uh, the disease severity. And uh, there is limited exposure to the available technologies. And we don't really have a coordinator to kind of take care of the follow-ups. But when these things come together, you really see an improvement in uh, card, you know, out, outcomes for pulmonary embolism. Like for example, before you had this structural program, you had a length of stay of nearly eight to 12 days and about 26% of uh, readmission rates. And um, you know, thrombolytic use was high and thrombolytic related complications like bleeding, intracranial bleeding, et cetera, were also significantly higher, okay? You see you have a STEMI team for myocardial infarction, you have a stroke team for stroke. Pulmonary embolism is one that we still don't really have a, a strong program even in United States, there are about like maybe 10 or 12 centers that really have a, a strong per, per program. And there are a lot of reasons why that doesn't happen. Um, does a PERT program really improve outcomes? Or does PERT decision making lead to an improved care? I think the answer is yes. You know, it definitely decreases the length of stay. And you see an improvement in survival functional limitation of quality of life issues. RV dysfunction is distinctly improved and the RV pressure overload situations are also improved and there are less instances of residual pulmonary vascular obstruction post therapy. How do we see that? We see that in uh, Cleveland Clinic experience, pre and post birth, you can see a distinct drop in 30 day mortality, major clinical relevant bleeding and uh, Interestingly, even in the need for IVC filter placement. And there are multiple studies that show very similar results, which I have kind of set here. Um, what a PER team really seems to be doing is decreasing the length of stay to about three to four days. And especially if you use a device to take the clot out, they seem to be going home in three days or so, which is almost like 50 to 60% less compared to previous. And what the team really is requiring is a team of physicians that come together when the patient is admitted. So the one idea is that as soon as a PE is diagnosed, you alert the per team physician. It could be a team of pulmonary intensivists, radiology, interventional cardiology, and vascular surgery. You know, um, and also if you look at the PERT consortium recommendations, you even need a hematologist to be part of it. Now, that is one of the reasons why the, pro uh, the program is a little bit difficult to put together because there are too many people that need to be activated at that time. And that, you know, is one of the problems that we faced in putting this program together. You know, uh, I'll touch briefly on this classification. I think the next speaker is going to speak about you know, how to nomenclature and classification. But basically, we are saying, is it a low risk that needs IV heparin? or in a massive risk that we need to do something more where there is hypotension and RV dysfunction and needs inotropic support or something in between which is an intermediate risk or submassive, okay? One of the you know, stratification protocols that you have, which is pulmonary embolism you know, risk indexes, none of them seem to be looking at some predicted you know, outcome predictors like uh, RV dysfunction large clot burdens, central clot where it is, even the PERT consortium recommendations and uh, risk analysis, 
doesn't look at these three things, which is a little more recently have been recognized as major contributors to morbidity and mortality. Okay. So what we have seen is if there is a large clot burden, then there is almost a 17 to 18% increased risk of mortality in the next six months. And the risk of adverse events at six months also is still about two and a half to three percent. And if the clot is central in the main pulmonary artery, pulmonary, which is in about 40 percent of the cases, the mortality is significantly increased also. You know, about 40 percent is in the central artery and 27 percent is subsegmental and is kind of gone beyond disto. And the rest of them are in the main branches. Okay. At least 50 percent of the patients with acute PE have concomitant DVT, okay, which adds to morbidity and mortality. All right. So why do we, what do we need to start a PERT program, which is, you know, probably the basis of our talk. First of all, you need a physician who's going to take ownership of this program. Second, it has got to be a multidisciplinary team to get through it for a variety of reasons. For diagnostic purposes, you need pulmonary and hematology. Fortunately, what we can kind of tone it down and say, they can see them next day. They don't need to be seen in the ER itself, which is a little different from uh, the PERT consortium recommendations is, is that uh, you have a face-to-face -face or a Zoom or, you know, some kind of a curbside consult with the whole team. And what, more importantly, your institution needs to believe that this is an important thing to do and you have to first convince them, which is, you know, not very easy these days. And then there are certain roadblocks to creating this team and current management, okay? You know, we need to develop a set protocol by which you are going to, you know, uh, treat a patient and then see if that treatment is working by tracking performance and impact and then you have to share your success with the administration and the rest of the team, okay? What does this team actually consist of? At least in our place, it starts with pulmonary intensivists, mostly because the first referral is going to go to them when, when they diagnose PE. You know, the ER, they see shortness of breath, they rule out cardiac. The next thing is they do a CT scan and it goes to pulmonary intensivist. And that may be different in different hospitals, especially in India, like I was finding out recently. And then you need an interventionalist. Traditionally, it has gone to radiology. And what's happened in our program, at least, is when radiology is called in, they will take the clot out if you tell them to take it out, but they're not ready to see the patient and make a clinical decision on which patient needs to go and which patient doesn't need to go. And that's a very crucial decision that we need to take. And the third thing is whoever is the interventionalist needs to be comfortable with the, you know, various technologies that are available. You know, at least every program probably should have one catheter-based thrombus aspiration system. There are at least four of them that are, we are aware of. and. Uh, you know, it is good if they are comfortable with being able to decide when to put an ECMO catheter and be able to actually do it. And usually this means that you are looking at an interventional cardiologist to do that, you know, because the decision to go to the cath lab, the decision to uh, decide on which device to use, and if the patient crashes, like what our patient did, uh, the decision to when to put in an ECMO and how to put in a right heart cath and interpret the results to decide on the ECMO, is not going to be possible with the help of a radiologist. And so invariably you will get sucked in and you better train yourself to know how to do these things. And of course, you know, you need a hematologist. Obviously he doesn't need to see the patients urgently, but at least next day. And then you need somebody to take ownership and follow up, okay? Then the, when the PER team is activated, the navigator coordinates and, you know, you set the protocol and you go forward, okay? But now this is, you know, easier said than done. You know, first of all, our training is a difficult. Like I said, radiology may not be the perfect choice for being the internationalist, and they may not be able to put it in. And the biggest challenge that we faced was how do you divide the call burden? You know, who's going to see this patient at night? And who are they going to call? And we came to the conclusion that we have to work with radiology in order to do this, okay? And, uh, I think somebody is talking about devices, but there are two basic approaches to these devices. One is the ECOS catheter, where it's an ultrasonic and intraarterial thrombolysis device. The catheter is going to set up ultrasonic vibrations, which kind of fragment the clot a little bit and make the uh, TPA work better. 
and two, you are going to reduce the dose of TPA from 100 milligrams in one hour to about one milligram per hour for the next 15 to 24 hours, which total dose will be about 15 to 20 milligrams. So the risk of intracranial bleeding and bleeding elsewhere is significantly less, but not zero, okay? The other one is mechanical aspiration with various devices. Each one has its own advantages, a little bit of an itch, et cetera. The first big one is, of course, the angiovac, where the catheter has a little funnel kind of thing. It's almost 24 to 30 French. And uh, when you go in, you connect it to an VV ECMO device, you know, and in between, they put in a filter. The advantage of this device is that it has a very powerful suction. It can suck it out, it can filter, and give the blood back as it is done, just like a VV ECMO, okay? The next one is the uh, Inari catheter on this side, which is a mechanical aspiration system. You have a little bit of a nitinol spring kind of thing at the uh, tip where you go beyond the clot and you pull it back into your catheter and you suck out. And it works very easy, it is very quick to set up, etc. But when you suck it out, you pull out at least about 200 cc of uh, blood also if you're not right in the clot. So if you do one or two aspirations, you're pulling out almost like 500 cc of blood. And there's not a very good way of returning it back, although there are ways to do it. And then of course, then the, this is the penumbra system, which we are all very familiar in the cardiology world. It is the same exact system, except the size of the catheters are about like 16 to 12 to 16 French. Among the three devices, that is probably the smaller uh, French size. And uh, these days, there's an AI program integrated into this device where you can uh, <coughs> detect when the catheter is in the clot, and then it will aspirate. And if you are off of the clot and in the blood, then it's going to stop aspirating. So you can actually have an audio <coughs> kind of a response to it, where it will tell you that you're in the clot or not, okay? <clears throat> so the next question is, if the patient presents at night, who needs to go emergently at night, and who is the patient that you can potentially wait till next day morning at least, okay? So because, you know, with these resources stretched the way they are with STEMI strokes, et cetera, <clears throat> and cold legs and ruptured aneurysms that we do, this becomes a big deal. Okay, so we came up with a simple modification of the algorithm for that PERT complex, I mean, the PERT consortium started. We dumbed it down, made it simple to a practical extent that we do. The first thing is, is it massive PE and is it hemodynamically unstable? So we do a echo a bedside. If you see RV dysfunction, if you don't see it, then you have to look for other reasons for, you know, hypotension and hemodynamic shock. Suppose it is positive, then as far as possible, do a night CT angiogram and confirm that it is a PE. If there is no PE, then you look for other reasons for you know, compromise. And if it is positive, then you treat him as high-risk PE. Now, the next question would be, what do we do with these high-risk PEs? Do we give them? So in terms of pure logistics, we came to the conclusion that I'm not going to take a massive PE that is hemodynamically unstable to the cath lab. We first give IVTP unless there's a contraindication. If, the, if that fails to revive the patient, then we go to the cath lab. So that way you can cut down on uh, the time and uh, also the number of patients that need to rush to the cath lab. The second is the intermediate risk submassive PEs. Those can potentially <clears throat> wait till next day morning. And how do we decide which one goes to the cath lab at night? We figured out, or at least we think, that those that are presenting with syncope and sinus tack probably indicate RV pressure overload, and uh, those are likely to benefit from going right in the middle of the night. And if you don't have those two, you should probably do it first thing in the morning, you know, next day morning when everything else is available. And if it is low risk, of course, you do the regular heparin and you move on, okay? So that's at least the modifications to the PERT program uh, okay. algorithms that we made and that we are following. And the first call after the pulmonary intensive is it goes to the cardiologist who will have a, at least a telephone discussion with the pulmonary intensivist and decide if we need to go to the cath lab or what are we going to do. And uh, in conclusion, what I can say is it becomes imperative for interventional cardiology to get involved in this pulmonary embolism program. We have been seeing a whole lot more pulmonary embolism after COVID than before. Either we did not recognize it before and we did not do any of these things, or something has changed since then. 
we are almost having to do about two to three per month of these procedures, you know, compared to let's say four or five years ago. And uh, clinical decision making also, anticoagulation or emergent or at middle of the night ur urgent interventions, et cetera, can only be done with the help of interventional cardiology. And then modifying a management algorithm to suit your local hospital systems is probably more important than following to the letter what is written in the PERT consortium recommendations. <coughs> of course, if you can have a navigator that will take care of the long-term management follow-up, that would be perfect. So in other words, this program, if you try to put it in place, you can definitely improve mortality and morbidity. And while it is not easy, it can still be done. Thank you very much. Yeah.